Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning and to be part of the symposium. A big thank you to the Air Force Academy for the invitation and for all of you for coming. This is my first time out here to the Academy. I arrived on the heels of a snowstorm on Wednesday, but I got here. Um, I live, as Allison said, I currently live at Fort Meade, Maryland, and I have found that the word currently often comes in handy when you are in the military. Uh, before we moved to Fort Meade, my family had moved three times in three years. Army wives, or military wives, actually have a saying that I think comes in handy. And actually, Gen General Hitmeyer had also used it at the uh, forum, the Women's Forum, the other night, that bloom where you are planted. As you continue your service to nation, you may not always get your top choices of assignment. In fact, you might get your last choice, or you might get a choice that you didn't even know was possible. And that reminds me of when I was very young. My family, we were stationed at Fort Knox, Kentucky. I was about six years old. And my dad received orders for Buffalo, New York. There are no army posts in Buffalo. And I still remember my mother saying over and over again, Buffalo, they're sending us to Buffalo. And it, as it turns out, my dad was going to be a PMS for an ROTC department at a college there at Canisius College. In the end, the assignment turned out to be a blessing for my parents. They bought their first house. The public schools there were excellent. My mom was able to go back to college and get her bachelor's degree free of charge there at Canisius. And in fact, my parents liked it so much that they actually ended up extending. The takeaway is make the most of all of your opportunities. Resist having an attitude that, and, and an energy uh, that you are entitled to something better. Take the time and the effort to get to know people, forge new relationships, new friendships, get involved in your community. Because before you know it, your assignment will have come and gone and you will be moving on to the next place. And what will you have to show for it? That is something that will be up to you. And you might find, in hindsight, uh, just like my parents, that not getting what you want can be a marvelous stroke of good luck. The title of my remarks today is A Woman's Calling, Service to Nation, but it's not a subject that I believe that should be taken off the shelf and dusted off just once a year during with Women's History Month. Uh, women are an <laughs> integral part of the military team. I wrote Undaunted for them, but I also wrote it for the rest of us so that we can better understand, appreciate, and learn from their experiences. And that makes for not only a stronger and healthier uh, military team, but also a, a better military community. When I think of the word calling, I think of um, the path that you have chosen for your life journey. Uh, it's a journey that many of you started back in high school when you decided to apply to the Air Force Academy. And I'm sure that many of you have blossomed and flourished while you've been here. But I'm sure that others of you have struggled, perhaps struggled with academics or struggled with issues going on in your personal life or your families back home. Maybe you're wondering if you're on the right path. I'm here to tell you that that, that is OK, because sometimes journeys involve U-turns. Journeys are about self-discovery, making mistakes, learning from your mistakes and while still honoring your commitments. When I was your age, I thought I wanted to go into broadcasting. That seemed like a cool thing to do. So in college, I took TV and radio courses. My sister, when she was a lieutenant, she was stationed in Kaiserslautern, in Germany. So I spent the summer with her, and I interned with AFN. And it was at that point that I realized I really didn't want to go into broadcasting. And so I fell back on what was really always in my heart, and that was to be a writer. My work as a journalist has afforded me many opportunities to interview people from all walks of life. Some have led celebrated lives. 
Others have led lives of struggle and uh, people who have endured immense tragedies. But I've also I've, I've found that oftentimes people who are in the celebrated category, guess what? They often also fall into the second category. They too have endured loss and struggle. And yet they still have found a way to achieve through old-fashioned hard work and a positive attitude. I've always been humbled and inspired by people who, despite obstacles, they've chosen to move forward, to move, make a life for themselves and for their families. And along the way, they make it a priority to reach out, to help, to, and to mentor and to influence others. And that is not only a trait of a generous person, but also an effective leader, and not just a person who is out for themselves. You are in a service-oriented profession, and that's one of the reasons why I enjoy writing about military people so much. I got my start as a writer, not in books, but in newspapers. Years ago, I had heard the advice that if you want to make a living as a writer, which means you want to eat three meals a day, go into the newspaper business. Uh, and so that's what I did. I tell other people's stories for a living, but today I want to share with you a little bit about my own journey. Uh, before books and TV shows and speaking engagements, and I hope that it can give you some encouragement as you pursue uh, your own goals. Because no matter what age you are, what stage of life you're in, we all face struggles and challenges and tough decisions. But we should all strive to be lifelong learners. Albert Einstein said, once you stop learning, you start dying. Over the years, I've learned that part of being an effective writer means you have to be a good listener. So I've spent a lot of time um, over the last 20 years listening in the military community. And along the way, I've learned that people are more than their official bios, and they are more than the ranks on their shoulders. I've learned that there are many characters in the military. That's one of the reasons why I enjoy writing about military people so much. All of you are individuals. You come to military life on various paths and from different backgrounds. You serve and stay for different reasons, and yet here you are at the Air Force Academy serving a cause that is greater than yourself in a profession that is more than just a job. President Bush, in his last State of the Union address in 2008, referred to military people as compassionate. It may sound like a, a curious uh, word to use, especially if you're a 19-year-old uh, who wants to join the Marine Corps or the Airborne Infantry. You probably would have wished the president would use a different term. Uh, and this is what Bush said that night, and I quote him, America is a force for hope in the world because we are a compassionate people and some of the most compassionate Americans are those who have stepped forward to protect us." End quote. The president was right. It takes a compassionate person to put a nation of families before his or her own family. And that is what is often uh, called for uh, with our service members. And that's why it's such a privilege for me to be here today and to be able to discuss various aspects of military life. It's a life that growing up as an Army brat, I didn't always appreciate. My dad served 30 years in the Army. I grew up moving from place to place. When I graduated from high school and was going off to college, my dad was still on active duty, and I couldn't wait to get away from the Army. And as a bonus, I was going to have four years, four years in the same place. And then bit by bit, an interesting thing happened. I realized the military was a part of me. And I had this newfound appreciation for my upbringing and for, for my roots. And sometimes you have to be away from something to truly have an appreciation for it. Military service tends to run in families. Can I see a show of hands of how many of you come from military families? Okay, quite, quite a few of you. My, my sister, she followed in my dad's footsteps. I think I would have been like Private Benjamin if I had joined the <laughs> Army. But I had this light bulb moment. What if I can combine my love of writing with my interest in the military? I was 19 at the time. It seemed like a plausible idea, uh, worthy of pursuing. I, I thought and I hoped 
I had something to offer the military as a writer, but dream chasing can collide with reality. After college, I was armed with lots of optimism, but little experience. It was a little bit like wanting to perform on Broadway, but your only experience was in your high school musical as an extra. This was in the days before there were a lot of college internships for writers. So I applied to a number of military magazines and military newspapers, GS jobs for writers, and I was soundly rejected by all of them. Usually I got a postcard in the mail. This was in the days before email and the internet existed. Uh, but an editor with Stars and Stripes took the time to write me back, and he told me that I really needed to go out there and get experience first. But of course, that can be a catch-22, right? Because everybody wants you to have experience before they hire you, unless, unless you are willing to work for free. And so that's what I did. My sister was stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So I went down there, and I walked into the Post newspaper, and I said, can I write for you for free? I think they thought I was crazy. I waitressed in the evenings and on weekends. Um, my sister was kind enough to take me in, especially since I was often delinquent on my share of the rent. And I remember from those days how disappointed my parents were in me. Here they had paid for my college education. I had just returned from more than a year overseas on a Fulbright scholarship. All of my Fulbright friends had plans in place to earn their PhDs and become professors or lawyers or doctors or teachers. And I tried to explain to my parents that this was a means to an end. And I'll never forget what my mother told me. She said, Tanya, what if things don't work out? What if? The fear of the unknown can be a scary place to visit in your mind. Well, Mom, you know what? Sometimes you have to take a chance. You have to take a chance on yourself. You have to be willing to start at the bottom. And you have to make opportunities for yourself when no one is knocking on your door. And no one was knocking on my door in those days. But after six months, I landed my first newspaper job. It was at a small town weekly newspaper. The uh, circulation was less than 5,000. It was so small that I was surprised to find out on my first day that I was the only reporter who would be working there. And then my editor handed me a camera and I was going to be the only photographer as well. I covered everything from car accidents to board meetings to church spaghetti dinner fundraisers. It wasn't exactly the kind of writing I was interested in, uh, but I was grateful for the opportunity. And while I wasn't covering the military, at least I was getting a paycheck, although I think I made more uh, when I was a waitress. But here's, here's an important piece of my story. I was this little newspaper's second choice. The first hire quit after a week for reasons unknown, and I received this desperate call from the editor. Could I start work that Monday? Eventually, I got my own place. I lived in someone's backyard above their garage for $150 a month rent, which was, I think, a little too high. It was uh, a little like living in Fonzie's apartment, but with roaches. And I'd lived there until two men tried to break into my bedroom window one night at midnight when I was asleep, a little scary. Uh, back in those days, I drove a used car where the steering wheel would rattle if you went above 30 miles an hour. And I drove that car until uh, someone rear-ended me at a red light. So I could only go up from there, right? That's how I got my start in the writing business. Humble beginnings, close calls, and someone's second choice. And I share that story with you because opportunities, no matter how small, often beget other opportunities. We can look at events in our lives as stumbling blocks or as stepping stones. What helped me in those days and what continues to guide me is that I try to keep the word entitlement out of my vocabulary, because you never know when a less than stellar opportunity might lead. 
Eventually, I did land my dream job covering the military. I traveled all over the world with our troops. I never tired of telling their stories. While I, I've done my share of technical and hard news stories, um, it's always been the human side of military life um, that has been worth telling to me. And that is because service members are the heart and soul of our military. When I transitioned from newspapers to books, I was taking a leap of faith with no safety net. I was going through a difficult period professionally and personally, uh, but I had this idea for a book, and it was only an idea. Faraway dream, maybe obtainable, maybe not. There are no guarantees. And I really felt alone and like I was standing on shifting ground. And the fear of failure loomed large, and I remember my mother's earlier wor words, what if things don't work out? But you know what? What if things do work out? What if they work out beyond your wildest expectations? Next slide, or first slide. Thanks. The book I started writing in my cramped second bedroom uh, in my little apartment would eventually become the TV show Army Wives, which uh, is one of the longest, was one of the longest running dramas in basic cable history. Army Wives ran for seven seasons, and the Air Force played an interesting role on Army Wives. Uh, the show was filmed in Charleston, South Carolina, and so all of the C-130 shots came from the um, air base there, and the uh, show would always film around the schedule of the Air Force. Uh, the final season of Army Wives, next slide, included um, and Brooke Shields. She played the role of an Air Force colonel, a tough cookie pilot named Kat Young. When I met her, I asked her, um, how do you like wearing a flight suit? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, oh, I love it. It's my most favorite outfit. <laughs> and that is a quote. And an Air Force friend of mine uh, did tell me that Real Air Force people don't wear their flight suits quite as tight as Brooke Shields uh, did. <laughs> the show was filmed at fictional Fort Marshall, which was loosely based at Fort Bragg, where you might uh, re recall that's the place where years earlier I got my start holding on to the vibrating steering wheel on my way to cover a spaghetti dinner at the, the fire hall. Uh, so things really do come full circle in life. Catherine Stockett, who wrote The Help, has anyone read that book, The Help? Yes. She received 60 rejection letters from literary agents. Uh, the 61st agent took a chance on Catherine and her manuscript, and three weeks later, it became a mega bestseller, then it was turned into a movie. And Catherine Stockett has said, what if I had given up at 15 or 40? or even 60. The takeaway is, if you want something badly enough, don't give up on yourself. I re was reminded of that years ago when Army Wives first aired, and I was interviewed by a reporter with TV Guide, and she told me that I was one of the few authors she's interviewed who actually liked how her work has been depicted on the screen. Not exactly a conversation I thought I would ever have in my life. When the show first aired, I thought people would watch it for the entertainment value. It is TV, after all. But that changed once I started traveling and meeting people from the military community, and they told me what the show meant to them. Several years ago, I was at Fort Sam Houston, and I was approached by a young wife. She had a baby in a stroller, and she told me that her husband had been severely burned from the waist up in Iraq, and he was facing a lengthy recovery there at the burn unit at Fort Sam. And she told me that the one thing that she and her husband looked forward to each week was watching Army Wives together because it was something that they could do together, they could discuss it, and it took their mind off of other really serious issues. And it was after that conversation that I realized Army Wives was more than just another TV show and it was more than just entertainment. And I also realized this composed young woman, she couldn't have been more than 23 years old, just how strong she was and how strong she would have to be in the years to come for her family. And I think of those great words from Eleanor Roosevelt about confronting our, our fears. And I include this in my, this quote in my second book. We must do the thing we think we cannot do 
We must do the thing we think we cannot do. Strong women. In my book, Army Wives, I look at military life through the eyes and experiences of spouses. In my latest book, Undaunted, next slide, I focus the lens on service women. Every book starts off as an idea before the first book, before the first word is ever written. And usually something will spark that idea and plant a seed for a book. In the case of Undaunted, that seed was planted uh, on a Saturday morning in the springtime on, on Fort Bragg at Sicily Drop Zone more than 20 years ago. My sister Maria was a new Army captain. My parents had recently retired from the Army and they were down visiting us at Fort Bragg uh, so they could see my sister jump out of a C-130 during what's called a fun jump. Uh, it's an opportunity for family members to come out on a weekend and watch their loved ones parachute. Even though soldiers have to get up at 4 or 5 in the morning, they still consider this fun, apparently, because they're not laden down with all of their heavy equipment that they would normally jump with. They actually call it a Hollywood jump. This was the first time that we would see Maria parachute. After the jump, as she walked off the drop zone, my mother was mortified for two reasons. The first reason is that Maria had a busted lip and there was blood all over her face. And the second reason is because Maria wasn't wearing any makeup. In my mother's mind, this combination was just not an acceptable look, regardless of the circumstances. Couldn't she have put on a little blush? My mother kept whispering in my ear. <laughs> In contrast to my sister, one of her peers uh, had so much makeup on that she didn't need a parachute. She could have parachuted down fluttering her eyelashes. Uh, my mother didn't exactly approve of that look either. She thought it was a little overdone for the occasion. It wasn't lost on me, the levity of this military event, successfully jumping 1,200 feet out of an airplane, took second stage to something that on the surface seems superficial but societal norms for women and their appearances played out on the drop zone that day. How do service women balance their femininity and military bearing? Are the two compatible? That issue is just as relevant today as it was back then. But mostly from that day so many years ago, I remember the confidence, the leadership, the youthfulness, and the optimism of my sister and her female friends. Over the last 20 years, I've witnessed their lives unfold in the military to include their professional successes, but also their private struggles and failures, which can be very different from what our military men experience. And I felt that these were issues worth delving into in depth. When I first started working on the book proposal, I was visiting my parents. It was the summertime. Um, my parents retired in Williamsburg, Virginia. We were at a, a church potluck, and my mother introduced me to the gentleman standing in line behind me, who happened to be a retired general. And he asked me what I was working on, and I told him about this idea I had to do a book on women in the military. And I'll never forget his response. Oh, that's been done before. And he brushed off the idea of it as if he was brushing a fly off his arm. And I remember I shot back at him, oh, not the way I'm going to do it, because of course all writers think that we're going to bring fresh perspective and something new uh, to a book. But I can't help but think if I had told him that I was working on a book about D-Day or Lincoln or Elvis, would he have given me the same response, oh, that's been done before, or would he have delved a little deeper and asked what angle or why this topic? or maybe he would have just moved on to his potato salad. I don't know, I'll never know. In the media, there's a tendency to view military women as one dimensional, one issue. Many times the phrase women in the military translates into women in combat, and more recently, sexual, sexual assaults in the military. But Undaunted and the reasons I wrote this book are about much more than combat. I look at what it takes to succeed as a woman in today's military. I knew professional success in the military often comes at a personal price for men and women, but women face their own set of unique circumstances and challenges, things they often deal with privately out of public view, and that's something that I wanted to examine. Issues such as balancing marriage, motherhood, and the military, blurred gender roles, 
the impact of discriminatory labels in the workplace, and finding the right balance between femininity and military bearing. Undaunted is about women who have chosen a profession that is outside society's norms for women. And what makes this dynamic so fascinating to me is that military men, military culture tends to be traditional, add into the mix non-conventional women, and it keeps things interesting. I also wanted to take a close look at not just the physical strength and endurance these women have to have, but also the mental and emotional strength, stamina, and courage it entails, and what all of us can learn from these women. I can't think of better role models for our young people, not just our daughters and granddaughters, but also the young men in our lives. And how fortunate you are to have someone like General Johnson here at the Academy. Having a sister and many female friends who have served or are currently serving, I felt like I had a pretty good foundation of the issues going into this project. But I have to tell you, it, it wasn't until the book was completed that I realized just how courageous these women are on and off the battlefield. It's amazing to think that prior to 1967, women could not make up more than 2% of the armed forces and they were not allowed to rise abo above the rank of lieutenant colonel or commander. There was a time when service women could not marry. Then they could marry, but they couldn't have babies. Up until 1975, pregnant women were forced out of the service. There were many vocal critics who were against allowing women to join the service academies in 1976. Can you imagine being in that first class, being 18 years old, knowing that your fellow classmates, many in the cadre, many of the graduates were against you and wanted you to fail. It's hard to believe now, but it took the Supreme Court in 1973 to rule unconstitutional a law that, had, that denied a servicewoman's family basic benefits, such as housing, medical care, use of the BX, use of the commissary. All the things that were authorized to a military man's family were denied to a servicewoman's family, and it had to go to the highest court in our land to bring change. We've come a long way as a military and as a society. When Undaunted came out, by pure chance, the book release coincided with the Defense Department's landmark announcement lifting the ban on women in combat. The Defense Department has ordered the service branches to open all combat arms jobs to women by January 1st of 2016, as I'm sure you're aware. We'll see what happens. This is a story and an issue that is still unfolding. Integration has been a gradual, methodical process. The long-term impact, I believe our military will be stronger because of these changes, and American society will benefit as well. Why? Because all service members, regardless of gender, will be allowed to pursue their goals and reach their full potential. And that makes for not only a better military, but a better culture, society, and country. To me, this is not an exercise in social equality. It's about enhancing military effectiveness. Because you're no longer discriminating against a talented segment of your workforce based solely on gender. Commanders and leaders should be able to pick from the best pool of service members, regardless of gender. While Undaunted is about four specific women, many of their experiences are emblematic of what so many service women experience. And just like in Army Wives, it was important for me to go beyond caricature. I'd like to introduce you to the women in Undaunted. To me, they are the definition of strength. But what I learned from them is that strength is often born out of struggle. And that's why their stories are so important. And I hope that these women are as inspiring to you as they have been to me. These women are quite different from each other. They range in age from their early 20s to their mid 50s. Their ranks run, fr run from the junior enlisted to general officer. What they have in common is a drive and a determination to succeed and to reach their goals despite significant and in some cases extraordinary obstacles. Being in this book requ required these successful women, all of them on active duty, to show their vulnerable side. Talk about taking a chance. Why would they do this? They knew that they are role models. 
and they thought that they could inspire and help others by sharing their story. And it goes back to what I said earlier about reaching out, mentoring, and helping others. I was interested in the backstory, a behind the scenes look at the sacrifice behind their success. I want to introduce you first, next slide, to General Angela Salinas, United States Marine Corps. General Salinas is the Marine Corps' first female Hispanic general. Next slide. When I heard General Salinas had founded her women's college basketball team and was the team captain, despite being only five feet tall, I knew she had to be a pretty incredible person. And it should come as no surprise that she has had many firsts as a woman in the Corps. Next slide. In the Marine Corps, she's known for her firm handshake, chewing butt better than the males, and that's a quote. And she was most likely the only general in the history of the Corps to use words such as hiney, woohoo, and rats patootie to great effect. <laughs> Next slide. Just like on the, ba the basketball court, General Salinas was used to being places she was not expected. She was not always wanted, and she knew that more than a few people would have been happy to see her fail. During her 38 years as a Marine, she's had five knee surgeries, a back surgery, and yet, at the age of 56, there she is leading 318 and 19-year-old young men on a spirited four-mile run each week at an all-male boot camp that she commands. It was important for her to never appear weak, although she was often in a considerable amount of pain. When General Salinas entered the military as a recruit in, at Paris Island in 1974, women were issued makeup kits instead of rifles. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. It was important for me to have one of the main subjects of this book be a seasoned military woman who got her start in a military that little resembles the one she serves in today. And I found that and so much more in General Salinas. Moving on to the next slide. Lieutenant Bergen Flanagan is a 22-year-old baby-faced introvert and newly minted officer who wanted to go to airborne school, though she'd never been on an airplane. Next slide. She finds herself leading troops as a platoon leader on the front lines in Afghanistan, serving in the same military police company as her husband. Next slide. And I don't want to give away her story, but I will say that she has been to hell and back. I liked the idea of telling a platoon leader's story in combat. The military police have an incredibly dangerous worldwide mission. Lieutenant Flanagan and her soldiers found themselves on a thick of, in the thick of it on a daily basis. She was always with one of her two squads, toting her M4 with a grenade launcher and a 9mm strapped to her thigh. One of the things that I loved about Lieutenant Flanagan's story is that it starts back when she is a cadet at Norwich University. Next slide which is a military college in Vermont. Then she graduates, she receives her commission as a second lieutenant. At this point in her life, she's what I refer to as a girl woman. She deploys to Afghanistan with her favorite stuffed animals, her favorite kind of candy, which is a child's candy, Laffy Taffy. And yet she's tough and she's determined despite, despite being scared of what she and her soldiers might face overseas. Next slide. Lieutenant Flanagan wants to do the best job that she can, and yet she struggles with these private doubts and fears. She doesn't want to let her soldiers down. She doesn't want to lose one of her soldiers. Being a platoon leader in combat, what an enormous responsibility, especially when you have very little experience and you're only 22 years old. What I found so encouraging about her young soldiers is that it didn't matter to them that she was a female leading them in a war zone. What mattered was could she do the job as the platoon leader? And that's what scared Lieutenant Flanagan to death. Moving on, next slide. Major Candace O'Brien, she juggles marriage, motherhood, and the military. I describe her as a brainy 33-year-old redhead who can outthink her fellow officers in the plans room and outrun them on the track. A West Point graduate, she's a hard-charging overachiever. When she deploys to NATO headquarters in Afghanistan, she leaves behind two young children, ages four and two, and a strained marriage. Next slide. 
I was attracted to Major O'Brien's story because she represented so many mothers in dual military marriages. Next slide. If you were to read Major O'Brien's resume, it's filled with accolades and accomplishments. What many of her colleagues didn't realize is that she accomplished all of these things while dealing with a significant amount of turmoil in her personal life over a number of years. How did she keep all the balls in the air? Can a military woman really have it all? And that's something I examine. Next slide. This is Mother's Day in Afghanistan. And next slide, homecoming. Last but not least, next slide. Sergeant Amy Stokely is a Marine drill instructor and a diva in boots who fancies false eyelashes, acrylic French tipped nails, and lipstick, all within Marine Corps regulation. But as you can see, she's not to be messed with. The 25-year-old is a martial arts black belt instructor, and she earned a combat action ribbon in Iraq. She survived a number of IED attacks, one that resulted in a firefight. Next slide. When I arrived at Paris Island, it was, there was a fascinating uh, dynamic. All of the female drill instructors looked like Sergeant Stokely. They all had long hair down to their waist that was pinned up in a regulation bun that did not exceed three inches. They ha all had fake nails, fake eyelashes, heavy makeup, belts clenched very tight around their waists. What was going on here? I'm not a psychologist, but I believe that these young women, they were all in their mid-20s and were in leadership positions uh, in such a, a macho and male-centric subculture there at Marine Boot Camp that they overcompensated to show that they were still women. Undaunted raise is an important issue, uh, the one that I first encountered on the drop zone 20 years ago, and one that service women still don't often talk about openly. Can one be feminine and still maintain a military bearing? What are the uh, unspoken rules? Is there a proper balance? Does womanliness interfere with respect and professionalism? These are questions that are outside the realm of military regulations that govern lipstick shades and nail length. Examples are plentiful throughout the book. Major O'Brien deploys to Afghanistan with her curling iron. Sergeant Stokely sprays perfume on the necks of her recruits before final drill. Lieutenant Flanagan goes through eight bottles of hairspray in a war zone. And General Salinas is known for her hair dryer taskers. While these may seem like casual details, they have to do with deeper issues of identity. Back at Paris Island, Sergeant Stokely readies her voice for the day by screaming above her car stereo on the way to work. She loves to make her recruits cry, and she makes sure she looks damn good doing it. In the book I write, at Paris Island, beauty isn't bashful, it's bold and badass. Next slide. Spending 140 hours each week with her female recruits, boot camp is segregated by gender in the core. She has little time for a personal life and is resigned to being married to the Corps. The first time I spoke with Sergeant Stokely over the phone, she spoke in a husky whisper. I could barely understand her. Do you have a cold, I asked. No, ma'am, I've just been yelling all day. And so our relationship began. I, look, I take a look at Sergeant Stokely beyond the bravado and look at the physical and emotional sacrifices it takes to be a walking, talking example of Marine Corps perfection. Sergeant Stokely had worked her way up from truck driver to drill instructor, and her story follows her path to the most revered position in the Marine Corps. Next slide. I like Sergeant Stokely's story because she taught her female recruits not only how to be good Marines, but good women. Sergeant Stokely put it bluntly to her recruits. Yes, we are Marines, and yes, we are drill instructors, but first, we are women, not men. The takeaway lesson, being a strong woman is not a masculine trait. I'd like to leave you with some final thoughts of what I learned from the women in Undaunted. Next slide. There I am with my sister at her promotion to colonel. And what I've learned from so many service women who I believe can be an inspiration for all of us. Although the title of the book is Undaunted, I was anything but when I was writing this book. Telling their stories on a deadline was like building a sandcastle, one grain of sand at a time, with one, one eye on the rising tide. Deployments, surgeries, overbooked calendars and schedules often left these women with little time for a writer, with endless questions. Flexibility became my watchword 
duty comes first in the military, and I became used to unanswered uh, emails and rescheduled interviews. Add into the mix, a month after I received my book contract, next slide, I found out that I was pregnant. I think I'm six months pregnant there at Paris Island. So the baby deadline was nine months, the book deadline, 12 months. The year ahead would also involve a lot of morning sickness and two PCS moves <laughs> for my family. When can she deliver, my editor demanded of my agent. Not the baby, but the most urgent and most important part, the book, of course. As my belly grew, so did my anxiety. Could I really birth a book and a baby? But I kept my insecurities to myself. But one night, it all came tumbling out in tears. We had just moved to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, surrounded by boxes. Nothing had been unpacked. The military quarters we had moved into were old, but not old in a good way. And um, unfortunately, they were really filthy. Uh, I was seven months into my pregnancy. The manuscript was due in five months. And I knew that there was no way that I was going to get everything done, including getting the house unpacked. We also had a little son. But I had to do it. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Were you and you alone, you have to find a way. And this reality and this fear of failing, well, it all came out in tears that night. And there's a quote in the book from Major O'Brien. When she is at her wit's end, and she's carrying a heavy load in Afghanistan, she's also dealing with family problems back home, and she says, when am I allowed to cry? What I learned from the women in Undaunted is that crying doesn't mean you're weak. It means you have a heart. It means you're human. These service women taught me, as I was struggling through their own example, that with determination and commitment, and yes, courage, and a few tears, that you really can achieve even under the most difficult of circumstances. In the end, I did accomplish both tasks, book and baby, although I don't recommend that combination to anybody. Next slide. And my little daughter, Violet, she taught me something else as well, that it really is possible to type 100,000 words with one hand. <laughs> Thank you all so much. It's been my pleasure to spend some time with you this morning. And I would be happy to take any questions you might have. Yes. Okay, so the question was, would I ever consider writing books about cadets at the service academies? I think that would be a great idea. This is my first time here to um, the Air Force Academy. And yes, the wheels are always turning for writers. I, I was really um, thankful that for this book that I got to include pieces um, of that story uh, at Norwich and also Major O'Brien. Uh, graduated from West Point, so I was able to go kind of back in time and, and recreate a little bit about, um, about her story. But yeah, I think that would be a fascinating idea. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. In your research and talking with the ladies that you came across, have you ever you come across the, the coalition side of the house? So we can be more special in America yeah, the, qu the question is, um, are the, the issue, issues um, facing us in the American military, gender issues, um, are they also faced in um, other militaries? Uh, interesting question because I, I do look at that a bit in the book with Major O'Brien when she is deployed uh, to NATO headquarters in Afghanistan. and. Um, she works with a number of people um, in, in the coalition. And so um, there are some very interesting scenes with that. She actually had some uh, roommates who were from France. And they would ha the, the women, service women, would have about uh, three months uh, of a deployment. And then they would cycle out, and she would get um, more French roommates. And yeah, the, the, the French women were really amazed uh, by all that the American service women uh, accomplished and, uh, and were really um, equals. 
and because they did not feel that way uh, in the in the French military. She, Candace, uh, Candace O'Brien, uh, Major O'Brien, also uh, worked for a French officer, French lieutenant colonel, and um, there were certainly gender issues there uh, of the way that things were done, and that does play out in some of the, the scenes of just having um, you know, mutual respect um, for, for one another. But she did, she did feel that she was seen differently uh, by the other the foreign militaries because she was a woman. Things were much better in the American military. And then, ma'am, you had a question. Oh, for, she's talking about Army Wives, yeah, arm, from the Army, Army Wives show. So, um, so I'm curious, though, are you considering writing from maybe a child's perspective, or oh, seeing that perspective, yeah. how the military has affected them in a relationship? Okay, so the, que the question was, uh, have I considered writing, writing from the perspective of a child's experience? And funny you should <laughs> ask that question, because that's exactly what I want to write about next, from the, the military brat's perspective. Um, uh, because I think that is a, a fascinating piece that's often um, overlooked. And I think um, part of having grown up my, myself um, in, a, in a military family, it's something that, that stays with you. You know, the military is more than just a job. It's a lifestyle that impacts the entire uh, family. So hopefully I can find some time. My daughter, Violet, who is in the picture, she's now three. And so it is, you know, it, it is a, a juggling act, juggling everything. But I, I would love to tell that story. Okay, yes. Yeah, I, I would say it's um, it's a life experience. It's a, you know, it was hard for me growing up, but now when I look back on on my experiences in the in the military, it's I'm the person I am today because because of uh, those experiences in the military. So I wouldn't uh, trade that for anything in the world. And when I talk to a lot of um, adults who grew up in military families and uh, who chose not to join the service or they didn't marry anyone who was in the service, the military is still such an important part of their, their life. Um, and it was, a, it was a tough transition for me when I was graduating from college and uh, my dad was getting ready to retire and I was trying to figure out, like most people, like, you know, where do I fit in? Where am, where do I fit into the world? Where do I fit into the military? Because I don't want to join the military. You know, so I, I think that, um, you know, I think it's normal for you to have questions and, and fears about having kids. I would encourage you to talk to others who have children, children of all ages from young to also um, older kids who are in their teens or maybe some who are now in college and to get their feedback uh, from it. But I have to say it's, um, it's, it's been a wonderful life in, in the good times and in the, in the difficult times. Yes. The number one fan. <laughs> well, how, how often were you actually involved in the filming or on mm -hmm. set? Or could you talk a little bit about sure. the experiences? Sure, sure, sure. So the, the Army Wives show. It, it's, it's amazing behind the scenes how, how a, a, a show, a hour show each week is put together. The show was written in Hollywood. That's where all the writers were. They were in L.A. And then the production team, when they were filming, they were in Charleston, South Carolina. That's where the, the actors uh, were also. And um, so my piece of it, uh, I was a consultant for the show. So I, uh, I was with the writers. And I did a lot of stuff with, with them. We did a lot of stuff, in, sometimes in person, but over email, 
phones. Uh, we're in weekly contact. And occasionally, I did try to get down to the set uh, about once or twice a season. Um, and that was always a, you know, a nice experience. That, but that was more for a, a visit than actual working. I was more behind the scenes with the writing piece of it. And I was really impressed with, um, with the writers and crew members. They had a lot of respect for the military. They wanted to get it right. When the show first aired, I think the military was a little like, OK, how are we going to be betrayed? How is this all going to work out? And in the end, it, ha it turned out to be a really uh, beautiful relationship and partnership, um, especially between the, the Army and the show. But it also branched out uh, to the Air Force as well. Yes, ma'am. Oh, gosh. You know, um, I have always loved, even though since a kid, Shel Silverstein. OK, a lot of you may be, I see a lot of yeses. So when you have kids, uh, introduce uh, the writings and poetry of Shel Silverstein um, to them. I'm, I'm starting to do that now with um, my son. Because really, now that I'm going back, and reading, because I have all those book, all of his books. Now that I'm reading them as an adult, a lot of it is really meant for adult reading. There are things, nuances that kids will miss, but it's, I think it's something that will really, really help um, develop a love for reading in your children. And I really credit him um, for me becoming a writer, because just the rhythm of the writing, the, there's Poetry has, there's music. Uh, there could be music in, in writing, in, in your head. And so um, I, I'm at, and right now, the book I'm currently reading, Don't Laugh, um, Harry Potter. <laughs> I, had, um, I had to have a collection of, of the books um, years ago. I probably had them for 10 years. Finally, I'm reading. We just, I just finished reading the first one to my son. Uh, we would read a little bit every night, and it was a lot of fun. And so we're getting um, ready to start the second one. And then I might stop, because if it gets a little too, too scary, I'm not sure. Um, he's eight years old. Um, but I would encourage you to really just read a variety of books, not, not only fiction, but also nonfiction. Um, you know, see what's on the bestsellers list. and. The New York Times, you know, read, read reviews. Um, you're not going to like everything, but try find time to read. I know it's hard here at the academy to have free time to to read. Um, and actually, I was I minored in in English, and having to be forced to to read eight books for one class in a semester, I was really turned off from reading when I when I graduated. Um, but so now I'm I'm getting back into my you know reading for just enjoyment. Any other questions? Yes. They talked about kids and, you know, the family life. What about the wounded warriors and their families? Okay. Okay. So, good question. I don't want to, has anyone read Undaunted yet in here? Anyone? Okay. I don't want to give away a part of the story for one of the characters, but that is an issue that is in Undaunted. That is, that's a big part of the book. <laughs> so it's there. <laughs> and then I'm not going to give anything else away. <laughs> so I can't expand on it, ma'am. <laughs> Any other questions?
just accepted the acceptance of the bag. She's going to have a school school. And she took a leave all the spring musical, so she's going to be single. <laughs> <laughs> No, please, no, please do. so much. And this will fit my suitcase because I didn't pack a lot. So great. Thank you. <laughs>